Well, man, I tell you, that was one of the greatest Sundays. You know, my family and I, we've been here about eight years now, and that was the, definitely in the top three of ever that we've experienced here. But good morning. Good morning. It is so good to see all of you. Welcome to all of you watching online. My name is Rusty, and I get to be one of the pastors here. And, and I am just thrilled about what God is doing around and in this place. In fact, uh, last week, like Pastor Doug said, it was phenomenal. I mean, there was no power, no worries. God shows up, 27 people get dunked, and I get to dunk my son. Like, it was fantastic, fantastic for sure. In fact, I was just in the, in the, in the restroom right before service, and there was a guy that got baptized last week, and he just starts telling me how his life is changing. Like how his life is changed. He starts crying and of course I start crying. I'm like, this is dumb. I got to (laughs) go. But it really is amazing to be a part of a church that's really all about about others. And so if you're new around here, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, We're in week two. Here's what we've done. These last two weeks, I want to take one more week and kind of recap an initiative uh, that we started one year ago, right? Uh, One year ago, we started this initiative called For the One, and it's all based on Luke chapter 15, where it's all about, you know, that that sheep that was lost or that coin that was lost or whatever it may be that God, here's the premise of it, God pursues you. That God always pursues you, and it's this amazing thing that that we get to see in our life. And so that's what this whole initiative has been about. And so I wanted to take one more week and really recap what the vision of our church is. This is what we are all about at LifePoint, that this is who, where we're going, that I want to just let you know why we do what we do, where, where again, I think it's amazing to be a part of a church that is saying, you know what, we're going to be about those who, who are either lost out there or lost in the house Whoever needs to be pursued by God, we're going we're gonna to pursue them for sure. There's another reason too, though. I read a book a long time ago called The Day That America Told the Truth. Anybody ever read that before? Here's what that book was. It was a book that was, they did a mass uh, survey. It's the first time ever. They did a mass survey on morality. And so they asked a bunch of different questions. And here's what they found, though. They found that people are definitely about themselves, that people are not all about other people. In fact, they asked this one question, and it was, what would you do for $10 million? Like, think about it. Like, what would you do for $10 million? And I know a lot of us have been thinking about that kind of stuff lately, because Powerball just hit for $2 billion, right? $2 billion. I mean, and I, listen, I know money can't buy happiness, uh, but in the words of the great theologian Chris Jansen, right? Uh, he's a country. I'm so glad y'all don't know country. It's so good. But here's what he says, but it can buy you a boat and a truck to pull it, right? I told you it ain't good for you, but I'm glad y'all don't listen to us. Good. But here's the thing that, what would you do for $10 million? Here's what they, here's some of the responses. Here's what it said. 25% of those who were surveyed, 25% said that they would abandon their family. What? Now I'm sure that number goes way up during the holidays, right? Especially with crazy Uncle Eddie's. And if you don't have one of those, it might be you. I've told you that many times. 16% that they said they would give up their citizenship. Uh, then it gets morbid though. 7% said they would kill a stranger. Better watch who you're sitting next to. Then this last one, here's what it says. It says 3 per- 3% said they would give their kids up for adoption. Folks, that's crazy. But I also know this is life points. So some of you are thinking, you know, Russ, well, it depends on the day. You know? <laughs> like, I, I get it. That's fair, you know. But see, again, I bring all that up to tell you that, that here's what life point, here's what we're all about. We are unapologetically evangelistic. That's what we're about. That I want to make sure that people everywhere know about the love and the grace of God. Here's our challenge, though, and I really brought it up last week. Our challenge, though, is that we, as we continue this mission, uh, I believe that God is calling us to be counterintuitive to rethink the way that we think, right? Where, where here's the truth though, uh, for us to grow, for, for you to grow, God needs to become bigger in your life and you need to become smaller. That God needs to be bigger and you need to become smaller. But there's also a point where there's this merger that happens uh, where what God is doing in you uh, also kind of reflects on what God wants to do through you. Where it's really important, though, especially as we're, we're, we're continuing in this vision, is to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page. I want us to all know where it is that we're going. I don't know if I told you this story before, but uh, there was this, a few years ago, there was a zoo in Spain. Okay? It's, it's much more like SeaWorld, like this huge theme park type of thing than a zoo. But there was a zoo in Spain that, that said, you know what, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page in case a gorilla escapes from his enclosure. And so here's what they did. They devised a plan. They did a drill and they devised a plan. They're going to put a guy in a gorilla suit. Okay. We're just going to name him Tom. We're going to put Tom in a gorilla suit 
and we're just going to do this drill, right? And so they, so they send out the email, they send out the mass text and say, all employees, here's what's happening, right? Uh, we're going to do this drill. Don't worry about it. It's not real. Here's what's going to happen. Except every single person got it except for the 35-year-old veterinarian that was only two weeks on the job. Didn't know it was going to happen. And so what happens is they start doing the drill and then Tom escapes in his gorilla suit from the enclosure. Well, the 35-year-old veterinarian sees it and says, I'm going to step in and jump into action. I'm going to save the world. Here we go. And so he jumps into, into, his, into his office, comes back out, finds a tranquilizer gun, shoots Tom with a tranquilizer gun that's meant for a 500-pound gorilla. Folks, super sad story. The guy dies. No, I'm totally kidding. I'd never tell you that story. Of course he doesn't die. That'd be horrible. <laughs> no, he was fine-ish. He slept for like a month and a half, but he was fine-ish, you know, like for real. But see, again, I bring all that up just to make sure that, hey, this is the vision that God has for us. I want to make sure that we're all on the same page that we are all moving this way, that I don't want one of us to be left to left behind. And so today, uh, here's what I want to do. I want to jump in and I want to look at a number of different uh, stories and, and a lot of them from the book of Acts. And so let me just give you a little bit of context about the book of Acts. At this point in time, uh, Jesus has ended his earthly ministry, right? He's been crucified, he's died, he's, he's risen again. But now it's all about the church being unleashed under the world. Right, where, where, where Jesus' mission was to, to build up his church. And so the overarching mission of that was to go out and tell the world, right? And again, last week I told you that, that this building, right? The building is not the church, but the church is you and I. And so God says, here, here's the thing. I want you guys to go on out. And here's what he says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And I know that when I read verses like that, some of us get a little bit uptight, right? We're like, oh, Russ, you know, I have no problem being the church in Lake Stevens, but I don't really want to go to Zimbabwe, you know? And I get that, but I think that's also where he's saying, I want you to rethink some of our mindsets, right? Last week I had you write down that that's one of our feelings, that I want you to rethink how it is that we think. In fact, the Apostle Paul reiterates it in Romans chapter 12. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Or again, I believe that God is calling us to his mission, though. Here's, here's, again, some of the challenge, though, is how many of you like your own opinions? Anybody in here like your own opinions? Yeah, of course, right? We all like our own opinions. Like, listen, my opinions are of the Lord. And I believe that all of you should follow them. And if you don't want to follow them, that's fine. You're welcome to be wrong. That's how I think, right? But here's what I also think that you all know. Is that how many of you also know, though, that truth can exist outside of what you believe? How many of you know that? Truth can exist outside of what you believe, which is exactly why I think, we're, again, we're called to rethink how we, how we think. And see, last week, I, I told you all the mission, but a lot of people in this room could not actually write it down because it was pitch black in here. So I wanted to re redo it again. So if you want, and when you came in, you got an outline in your program. Pull that up if you want to follow along. If you're online, just press the button. But here's LifePoint's mission. LifePoint's mission is this. It's people helping people find and follow Jesus. It's people helping people find and follow Jesus. And see, here's the thing. That's not unique, but it is clear. And that, that, that I just believe that if we can hone in on those two things, if we're focused on those two things, we, just, we believe that people's lives will be changed, that marriages will come back together, that relationships will be mended, that people will walk away from addictions and hurtful habits, that we believe that, that people will come to Christ in all of our county, in Lake Stevens and Snohomish and Granite Falls, everywhere around, that we believe that God can do amazing things. I don't know if you were here last week, but I told you that, that just in one year since we launched For the One, folks, there's been 128 people that have gotten baptized in this place in just one year. Or there's been 439 people that have actually accepted Christ for the very first time right here in one year. That we believe that God can do more and, than we could ever think or ask. In fact, look at what it says here. It says in Matthew chapter 9, it says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. 
So the question I have is, what would it look like if we were able to do exactly that? How, what would it look like if we could live that out? Like, like how do we engage for greater, for greater impact? Here's the first thing I wanted you to write down. There's three of them. Number one is that we recognize that we have an incredible opportunity. That we need to recognize that we have an incredible opportunity. And I don't know about you, but every time I hear kind of like that word opportunity and, and we get around the holidays, I always think about working out in January. Anybody else in here with me on that? Well, I, I mean, I've heard it my whole life, you know, oh, you got an incredible opportunity to, to get healthy, to work out, to, to feel better. It's this great opportunity, you know. In, in fact, one time I actually heard this and maybe y'all heard it before too. Did you know that, that Tom Brady is a vegan? Did you know that? Like I heard that, I heard that one time, I was like, Tom Brady, he's the goat. I don't know what you think about it, but he's literally the greatest of all time. And so I'm like, if this guy is a vegan, maybe I should try that. And so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna be a vegan. So I tried being a vegan, but then like after one hour, I forgot and I ate a sausage. Not even playing. <laughs> My point is this though, is that sometimes we can forget that an opportunity exists. Or sometimes we can forget that an opportunity has to be seized in the lifetime of an opportunity. We can forget that. And see, here's what I don't know if you, if you know, I, I obviously we've all lived through the last couple of years and, and COVID has been very challenging and difficult and all that. Uh, where what you do know is that, is that it's been one of the catalysts for actually dividing a nation, right? That our nation is very, very divided. But what you may not know is that I, it's actually this too, is that it's also been a catalyst for dividing our church. That the church in general, the big C church around America is extremely divided. Uh, where it's just had this, this negative impact uh, on the body of Christ. Or I don't know if you know this, but, but over the last two years, we have had hundreds of people come to us on our staff, our, our team, we've all heard it, where there's been hundreds and hundreds of people that have come up and said, hey, Russ, you know what? You're, you're, you're not far enough left for me. Or you're not far enough right for me. Or you don't speak enough on, on my particular uh, agenda. Or you speak too much on, on something else. And, and so you know what? Here's the thing. We're leaving. It's happened constantly for two years. Here's the thing I'd say about those, those, those things. There's two things I'd say. Here at LifePoint, here's the reality. We don't look left and we don't look right. We look up. Last week I told you. I told you that you know what? That, that God sits on the throne regardless of who sits in the White House or the center or anywhere else. And our hope and our faith is put in Jesus Christ. That's, that's what we're gonna do. But here's the second thing. Is that my heart also breaks from, from that loss. My heart breaks for the division within the church. My heart breaks for, for all of that. My heart breaks for, for those who, who are choosing to attend somewhere else that's fine. But, but it still hurts, and my heart also breaks for those who are choosing not to attend anywhere. It's kind of just gone by, by the wayside. But my point in saying this is this, is that to a dying world, I believe at this point right now, folks, we have an amazing opportunity to share the love and grace of Jesus Christ. To a divided world, we have a great opportunity to share exactly that. And see, here's the thing. There's some parallels that I want to draw from the book of Acts, which again is all about the church being unleashed to the world. But there's some parallels that, that we see as well. And here's one of them is, listen, God used difficulty to propel the mission. In fact, I'll give you a little bit of, uh, a little bit of context here because I don't know if you know this, but, but the way that he moved a rapidly growing group of Christians across the world, you know how he did it? Persecution. He did it through persecution. Where I know that doesn't sound all that much fun, but how many of you have seen that God has taken something bad and turned it into something good in your own life? Anybody in here? Of course. It says that he can turn anything bad into good for those who love him and are called according to his, his purpose. And see, in this moment in Israel's history, the church was being persecuted. People were being killed. Believers were in hiding. They were terrified. And you look, at, look at what it says in, in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Here's what it says. It says, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and, and Samaria. The great thing though, is what starts happening in verse four. It says this, as those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Folks, it just said that they took advantage of an opportunity. That they went out and said, I know that we have persecution, but I'm still gonna preach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this thing kept happening again and again and again for three chapters where person after person started coming to Jesus, finally culminating in Acts chapter 11. Here's what it says. It says, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch 
and began to speak to Greeks also, taking it to even broader lands, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Here's the principle that I want you to see, and it's not in your notes. You can write it down if you want to. God blesses where hearts are open. God moves when hearts are open. And see, if you think that I'm just taking a particular instance that we find in Scripture and I'm applying it across the board, uh, then maybe you missed last week where I told you that Jesus was trying to do a lot of miracles in Capernaum, but he couldn't do it because of the lack of people's faith, right? Or maybe some of you remember uh, the calling of Peter. How many, some of you do. I wanted to read it for you. Here's what it says in Luke chapter 5. It says, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw, at the, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats. Underline that for me. He got into one of the boats and one belonging to Simon and asked him to put out a little bit from shore. Then he sat down and, and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And then it goes on into verse 6 and says this, says, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And then in verse 10 it says, and Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid, for now you will fish for people. For now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed and followed him. My point in reading that is this, is not only does he bless where hearts are open, but here's what we also see in this story. God uses the boat before he fills the boat. And I'm going to do a whole lot more teaching than preaching today, but God uses the boat before he fills the boat. Where in verse 3 it says, he gets into the boat, uses it for his purpose, and then he blesses them. And I believe that the same is true for you and me. That God is calling us to use who we are for his purpose to, 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 to complete his mission. And then he blesses. And throughout scripture, do you know what that blessing is? It's people's lives being changed. That blessing is typically other people's lives are changed. Where I love Peter's response. It says he left everything and followed him where he saw, again, he saw an opportunity for more and he took it. This is where I'm going to move. Uh, about 11 years ago, 12 years ago, my, my family and I, we moved to, we moved to Washington. And uh, it's been a great Great move, and I'm thankful to the Lord for it, for sure, except for the rain. But it's been great other than that. And, and uh, but I remember when we first moved here, we, we moved to a church uh, in Redmond, and I was the, the executive pastor there. And, and from that church, though, they wanted to plant a church in Issaquah. And at that moment, I, I kind of looked at my boss and said, dude, I'm not doing this, because uh, I just didn't want to, right? Here's what you got to know. I've already planted three churches at that point in time. And so not only did I tell my boss that, I actually told God, listen, I ain't doing this. That was dumb. Because God did what God normally does. And he said, yeah, that's great. You know what? You, you, you are, are not going to plant another church. You're going to plant two more churches just because I said so, you know? It's kind of like, you know, if, I don't, maybe your kids are like mine and they're like, yeah, no, I'm not doing the dishes. And then mama looks at them and says, yeah, you will. And you're going to do the laundry and wash my car, right? Anybody experience that? Yes. Don't mess with mamas. And that's just called good parenting. Can I get an amen? That's right, right? But see, at this moment, I was like, man, I just don't want to do this. And, and you know, God said you were. So, so here's what kind of happened. Basically, uh, I started working on planting this church. And, and Mike, our, our worship pastor, he was with me at, at that time as well. And, and we started planting this church. And, and I, I met with some other church leaders up in the Issaquah Highlands area. And they're very nice people. Uh, but they also said, hey, Russ, here's what you got to know. Like, I know that you want to reach people. I get all that. Uh, but it's probably not going to happen here. Because here's what happens here. Uh, we have witches and sorcerers that chant against us on a weekly basis. I'm like, I thought that was really weird. Uh, but then I was like, well, it's the east side. So everything else goes. So why not? You know, I'll probably get in trouble for that statement. Anyway, uh, I'm like, I want, want, you know, whatever. And so we ended up planting a church here. But, but here's what they told me. Here's, seriously. They said, you know what? Uh, planting churches doesn't work here. Here's the phrase they use. This is a church planting church graveyard. This is a church planting graveyard. And at that moment, I didn't think I was any smarter than, than anybody else, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I, some of you know, I came from a very prestigious Bible college called the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, you know? 
anything with Vegas has nothing to do with Jesus. Let me tell you, right? It's, it just doesn't. But here's what I also realized, though. I also thought that, you know what, God hadn't run out of ideas when it came to Issaquah. My point in saying that is I don't think God's run out of ideas when it comes to Lake Stevens or Snohomish County either. That I think God is still in the life-changing transformation business. And out of that church, listen, we were able to launch that church and hundreds of people came to Christ. And not only were we able to launch that church, but another church has been launched out of that one as well. Where God has, has moved uh, in, that, in that arena. And see, the season of our church we're, we're, yes, granted, we've been, we've been focusing a lot on our own spiritual growth. And I'll just let you know, uh, coming in the new year, there'll be 21 days of fasting and prayer. There's also going to be uh, an entire small group um, kind of push for the entire church to go through the exact same small group as well. We're going to really tone in on, on our own spiritual growth. But even in the midst of that, here's what I don't think we can do. I don't think we can ignore the mission that we have in our region as well. Over the last two years of turmoil, here's what I believe. I believe that God has positioned us for our next great moment. That God has positioned us to be able to say, okay, I want you to reach out even, even further. Which leads me to the second thing I want you to write down. Number two is that we need to invest for spiritual growth and outreach. That we need to invest in spiritual growth and outreach. And I know that when I say the word invest, some of you get nervous because you think I'm going to talk about money. Uh, I am, so there you go, right? If you've been around for, for, for the one, uh, you've seen some amazing things happen, but you probably remember this as well. Like I said, one year ago, we launched this initiative, and it was an amazing time. I remember sitting right up here one year ago, and for those of you who don't know, there were, there were buckets lining the entire stage, and after five weeks of speaking on the vision of where God is leading us, I said, okay, this is the moment. This is when we're going to come forward and put our commitment cards in the buckets. But I said, hey, here's the deal, though. I want you to wait until I can get up and come over here and put mine in as well. My wife and I, we can put it in so we can kind of lead and put our Gearheart commitment card in there as well. Uh, but all of you kind of just ran up and did your own thing because nobody listens to me. And so all y'all just ran up and just put your things in there. And can I tell you this, that, that I could literally, I couldn't get out of my seat. Tears were flowing down my face. Because it was once again me seeing a picture of the church that is saying we're all about other people. My wife had to actually put our card in the bucket because I could not do it. Where is this amazing scene uh, of what God was doing in a group of people. And see, so if you haven't, if you weren't here when we, when we did that, here's what I am going to ask. If you're new within the last year, I'm going to ask you to jump on board with us. Well, here's what I believe. I believe that it's going to take 100% participation. If we're going to do the entirety of the mission that God is calling us to, I believe it's going to take 100% of us to actually accomplishment, accomplish it. I love what it says in Acts chapter 4. Here's what it says. It says, all the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in all of them. Here's what I think we need to realize when, we, when, we, when I read verses like that. Is that sometimes I think we can walk away from there thinking, oh, those are, those are special people. That was just during that time. Folks, you have to realize those are just ordinary people just like you and I. People who had kids, people who had a budget, people who were trying to make it, people who were trying to keep their head above water, people who were just trying to figure out how to deal with this. In fact, even more so, they were dealing with so much more persecution than maybe we are even dealing with now that, that it was even harder for them. But they were saying, no, I'm going to trust. I'm going to trust in you, God. And when they experienced real biblical community, that is what happened. And see, sometimes I'll be honest with you that, that sometimes I'll sit up at night and, and I'll just think, you know, what if? Right, like what if, what if we did this? What if we combined our gifts? What if we took our resources and our time and our gifts and, and rather than saying mine, instead we say, God, here, here's, what, here's what, you can have it all. What would our church look like? What could we do with that? You know, last week I read you probably six, seven, eight emails that we had gotten just in the last couple of months. Uh, this week I don't wanna do that. I want you to see a story of one more person though um, that God is doing a work in their life. Take a look at this. In me and my parents, we always, they always took me to church starting since I've been an infant, really. And I, as a kid, you're kind of more drawn to it, you know, it's more fun and more interactive. But when you start getting into like the youth and the adult aspect of it, you kind of start asking your own questions, your own um, thoughts start to weigh on your own mind. Like, could this be real? You know, is this just a thing that people follow? 
my grandma dying when I was like 16 and friends passing from different illnesses, you know? It's like, why would this happen? Why, why have a creator that brings in the pain in a sense, you know? Yeah, so I had a lot of doubts. For, I think it was like four or five years where I, I never went to church once. And I, I didn't really think I needed it. During that season of life, I just started to realize there was something like l I was longing for deeper than just a human connection. You know, it was stronger than that. I just felt there was something guiding me somewhere, but I didn't know what. I still had most of my family as like pure Christians who believed in God and were going to church still and kind of still trying to pull me back. And I was just kind of shutting that door for some reason for a long time and my brother specifically uh, brought me to church on Easter which was a really cool and special day for me. Start me and my fiance at the time we started talking about where this was leading and we believed in a God but we didn't quite peg it on Christianity quite yet. Um, so after Easter me and her stopped, talked it over and uh, we actually went to a couple different churches, trying them out, and ended up at Life Point. I think it was the first time, really, I felt the presence of God. Me and Olivia, we just looked at each other and we're like, I think this is it. Like, this is the church for us, man. And we left, and that was the first time I probably left smiling from a church. Alexio mentioned going to Alpha, and that was our first kind of big step for us of doing something extra than just a Sunday service, you know? I remember going there and actually being able to sit down at a group and talk about these hard questions that, you know, at an everyday church like Sunday, you wouldn't ask somebody because you're kind of scared. You don't know how they'd react or being able to pray with uh, Doug and Alexia was really special and I gave my life to the Lord that day. Olivia and I decided to get baptized. I really started to understand that it's a new life. It's a rebirth of yourself, living through God. And me and my wife talked about it, and my dad, who's always been kind of the leading figure in my life, he was able to actually baptize me. And then after I was baptized, I uh, baptized my wife. Just the life lessons I've been able to take away from this and actually apply to my everyday life and my marriage have been extraordinary and have guided me in a way better path. It's almost uh, overwhelming the power it has, you know, giving yourself to the Lord. Can we give it up for Luke? Can we do that? I love that story. I think it encapsulates a lot of what we were doing with For the One. Where if you remember, if you were here, For the One was about reaching out outside of these walls. It's about having another location where just to let you know, we've been, we probably looked at two dozen different locations right now in the surrounding area of Marysville or Arlington or, or Everett. Just say, God, what could you do if we put another one of life points, high grace, low shame, all that in another spot? I think you'd do something amazing. But it was also about internally building up what's happening here as well, where it was about um, hiring new staff pastors, being able to say, okay, what could we do with increasing our discipleship and all of that? And so he mentions Pastor Alexio. Alexio and Alex are a part of For the One. And because of them, we've been able to start starting point and do all these things that we have uh, Pastor Donnell, he and his family with our families that last week I told you an increase in kids and youth, 42% have happened in the last year because of a lot of because of the work that, that he's been doing with the team there as well. And so God's been doing something great here, but, but here's what I'd also say. Folks, that's one story of the 439 that have accepted Christ in one year. That's one story. And I think God loves that story. And I think that story is amazing because God is working in it because it's another person that he wants to redeem that story. And he's done it 438 additional times that we know of. Last service, I got to this point in the message and my, my watch started buzzing because Pastor Colin, who's another pastor we ever bring on board because we hired him for our fourth and fifth grade ministry because we care about our youth and, and 
How many of you know that our fourth and fifth graders know a whole lot more than we did at fourth and fifth grade? Yeah. He texted, he texted out the whole team. And he said, three more kids just came to Christ an hour ago. I just want us to realize that God is moving and we get to be a part of that. When you came in your program, you, there's one of these cards. Can you pull this out for me? Everyone do it, please, so the person sitting next to you doesn't feel weird. Can you do that? I'm just going to go through this card just real quick. A lot of you who are a part of For The One know exactly what this card is. And, and if you were a part of For The One before, I'm going to ask you to fill it out as well. Uh, just to kind of be a, as, a, as a recommitment and say, you know what? I'm, gonna, I'm doing this, God. I'm going to trust in you. But if this is new to you, here's what this says. At the top of it, there's a column that says, you know what? I, uh, this is what I normally give. And, and then it's adding in kind of your best gift, what it is that you plan on doing. And then adding up as well, maybe gifts from stored assets. And then you get the final one-year commitment. And maybe this is, you haven't given and, and this, you want this to be your first time ever. I think that that's amazing. You just fill in that. And, and at the exits, at the exits, there's, there's buckets there. You can just drop them in uh, as you go. But here's what I'd say about this. At, at LifePoint, we have a process. We have a formula kind of what we do with something like this. We don't do this because Rusty stands up here and, and says to. We don't do this because it's some emotional moment. We do this because here's what we do. Here's the process. We surrender to God. We listen to his voice. We obey what he tells us to do. That's what we do. But again, I don't want you to do it because I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I want you to surrender to God. I want you to listen to Jesus. And whatever Jesus tells you to do, that's what I want you to do. Because I just believe that if that's what we do, if we just listen to whatever Jesus tells us to do, listen, we're going to be just fine. But I also think that number three, here's what we need to do. We need to believe God for amazing outcomes. We believe God for more. About eight months ago, I, I preached a message on, on Mark chapter six, which is really the feeding of the 5,000. Many of you know it. And I'm not gonna preach the whole thing today. I'm probably already over time. I don't know. But I wanted to read it for you because I think there's some things in there. Here's what it says. But many people recognized them, Jesus and disciples, and saw them leaving. And people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, he, but he had compassion on them. Underline that. He had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he, he began teaching them many things. Late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. Jesus said, you feed them. I would have said, how? <laughs> Actually continues on in John chapter six, Philip replied, even if we work for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother spoke up said, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. Underline that for me. A young boy here with five loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. They all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered 5,000. Jesus took the loaves and gave thanks to God and distributed them to the people. Afterwards, he did the same with the fish. And they all ate as much as they wanted. I wanted you to underline those two phrases because here's the first thing. Number one, the, it shows us that the motive for this miracle was compassion. That Jesus had compassion on the people. They were lost if they didn't even have a shepherd. But the second thing I wanted you to underline was the, two, the boy that had five loaves and, and two fish. Because I wanted you to see that the means of this miracle was generosity. That this young boy said, I'm going to give up my lunch to Jesus. And I believe that he's going to be able to use it for his good and his glory. The best part of this whole story, though, is actually the message. As I'm sure a lot of you know, the message is way more important than the miracle because on this side of heaven, miracles fade. On this side of heaven, sometimes medically things come back up again. On this side of heaven, sin comes back up. On this side of heaven, we don't always get to just have everything perfect. It's not how it works. But the message stays alive. And the message in this was this. Jesus said, I am able. That, that, that the miracle happened because he had compassion. The means of it was because there was generosity, but the message was, I am able to do infinitely more than you could ever ask or imagine. 
And I believe that that was not just for then, I believe it is for now as well, that God speaks into our lives and says, I want the county, I want the place around you, I want Lake Stevens and every place else around you to be able to know that I am able. That regardless if there's a divided nation or a divided church or whatever in the world it is, that I am still able to do more than you could ever think or ask. And here's what I know about our church that we are grateful to even be a part of a mission that God has. That we get to see 439 people come to Christ. I'm sorry, 442, including the three that just came to Christ an hour ago. That's a privilege. And so, Father God, I thank you. I thank you that we are privileged enough to even get to watch you work. Lord, that you ask us to be on your team. God, that you even give us a seat to see it. And so, Father God, we ask that you will propel your ministry. We ask that you will propel your kingdom and that we get to be able to see exactly what you're going to do. Father, thank you for allowing us in the game. And so, Lord Jesus... This church is yours. We are yours. We surrender to you. And we follow your lead. God, I thank you for your love and your grace. I thank you that it's new every single morning. I thank you, God, for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.